Hello, uh, Dean Burnett again. Uh, video diary number five. I'll say five. It's numbers, isn't it? No one cares. Uh, it's Monday, um, the 11th of January. Uh, cat just stared at me outside. Genuinely unnerving, if you know my cat. Uh, he has a presence. And it's raining out. Got no real thing to add about that. Hence, I'm back in the box. This box. Uh, people keep telling me it's a sauna. <clears throat> uh, they think it's a sauna. It's not a sauna. It's far too cold for a sauna. And also, shouldn't keep books in a sauna, uh, as far as I'm aware. I mean, I've never tried that, but I'm guessing it's not good for it. You know, warp the spine and stuff. And I just now realised, looking at this, that uh, I tried to wear a brown jumper today, because I sort of blend into the background. So I'm sure someone could do some um, fun Photoshop with that. My disembodied head on an elaborate... Um, thing, <laughs> elaborate backdrop set in to into an alien or something. Feel free, if that's your bag, go nuts. Um, yeah, I uh, didn't really, uh, didn't do any videos of the weekend, um, partly because, you know, with the family over the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, I like to spend time with the children, uh, because I, don't, not that I don't spend time with them anyway, but Thursdays my wife works away, so I'm with them then, but there's all homeschooling stuff, and on the weekend, uh, you don't, don't, you don't do that, so we just do family stuff. Insofar as that's an option, because you know, lockdown, nothing's really open, can't go anywhere, anywhere tangible, really. So, yeah, it's um, it's a fun time of things, you know. But, uh, but I guess part of me thought, well, I could just keep the video going then, you know, just ad libbing stuff anyway. I'm just talking about the stuff that comes to the top of my head, and I thought, no, it's the things that are kind of important to draw that line, uh, because you know, technically, it's weekend, work from home all the time, no real difference for the rest of the week, is there? So it's all just blurred into one, but. It's kind of important to maintain that sort of timetable, that structure, that schedule, because otherwise you just completely lose track of what's where and when, and that can be quite disorientating and unsettling and stressful even. And, you know, I think people find that over, it's not so bad over Christmas, like the that period between Christmas Day and New Year's Eve. My friend Dave Seal calls it the uh, Merini the Merineum. Um, I know other people have called that since, but he was the first one I've heard call it that, and I was pre-internet, so I'm crediting it to him. Um, you know, but it's like those days they all blur into one. They, you know, you're either not working or you're just working a bit and you know, it's, you're still eating the Christmas food from a week earlier and you know, nothing really happening because everything's closed down or at least taken over for outside of pandemic time uh, for the Christmas period. So you, know, you just completely lose track of what's happening, where and when and why. And I think it's good to try and avoid that, especially when lockdown, when you know, all the days like, sort of blur into one because you know, the human brain doesn't track time like a clock. It's not like sort of increments, it's not like a second by second, minute by minute, constantly updating machine. It uh, it was far more qualitative, far more, far more analog. We measure time <clears throat> like landmarks in our memory. You know, it's been this long since that thing happened, or it's been ages. It's been a long time since my last holiday, which it has, of course, same goes for everyone else. Uh, it feels like, you know, you can meet someone, it's like, oh God, it feels like it's been both many years since I last spoke to you and 10 minutes because you just click back into regular rhythms. The brain doesn't really monitor time in you know, like a machine does. It's very far more flexible, far more analog. And it's not something you should really mess around with if you can. That's why we like schedules. That's why we like you know, a formula to our day. And when you start giving that up, it becomes kind of um, kind of messy. You know, you just lose track of what's going on where and then you know, everything sort of becomes this big blamange of just things happening randomly. And I think that's a lot of lockdown stress will come from that, I personally think, in that everyone's days have the exact same, uh, you know, properties. There's no sort of nothing to distinguish the passage of time. Especially in January, when you know, everything's kind of grey out, you know, the weather's consistent, nothing's really happening anyway. And that's why we have the most depressing day of the year, which is apparently in a week. Um, I've already seen articles pop up with my name on uh, for the most depressing day of the year imminent. Uh, because uh, obviously I've written about it so much. It's uh, ironically uh, for me, third Monday in January has become kind of the most depressing day of the year because people keep mentioning Blue Monday to me a lot. Um, you just Google Dean Bennett Blue Monday Guardian, you'll find my various um, output on the manner uh, on the matter. And it's kind of, I stopped eventually. I mean, I occasionally nod to it to say like this is a thing people are talking about. But got the point. I was worried if I stop talking about it. Will it go away? So why you, why you got the point where me whining about it was the main thing keeping it in <laughs> keep in, in in the mainstream? Not that I'm a huge name or anything, but look, I was constantly banging on about it in my 
my uh, my own inimitable way, shall we say. Um, yeah, actually, Blue Monday is the reason I do this, so I got to be right in the first place. I kind of should thank it in a way, but I'm not going to. It's really annoying. And yeah, but so like that's one that's one temporal landmark. But yeah, so I think if you can give your day your you know, your week some structure, so like this day is different from this day, that will help you. It's probably better for your mental well-being overall. Which is a very long-winded way of me saying I just don't want to do it. I'm to do this on weekdays or week weekends. Um, probably would have been more pithy sign off if I said it properly the first time, but I didn't. And I think, if anything, that's very on brand. Hello, Dean Bennett's video diary. Uh, day the nth. <laughs> don't know. I haven't done one of these for a few days because uh, <coughs> regular viewers, uh, I think there may be three. I'm not entirely sure. You may have noticed that some of the previous videos were a little bit uh, technologically haphazard in that you know, they just were out of sync or juddery or I mean, several times I'd upload something then take it down again and reprocess it and upload it again uh, just because it wasn't going right. And it came to the point where I realised my laptop was actually pushing five years old, which is like 107 in laptop years, isn't it? So... I had to get a new one, but of course, when you get a new laptop, well, I'm a Windows user, so I don't know if this applies to Macs, but when you get a new laptop, uh, you have to reinstall everything, get your system back set up, and that took a while, and then I had to do stuff, you know, I actually have work to do as well, and <clears throat> hiccups as well, that was a, that was an ongoing thing, and uh, yeah, so I reinstalled, now, now I'm back with a new laptop uh, with a big screen, because this is my desk laptop my main one just sits here i also have a laptop for travel in the house i'm pointing it like you can see it no one can see it it's just there and so now i have you know a main laptop this one this was bigger now so i can see myself on the screen i look much wider which is a bit you know dis disconcerting at first because i'm trying to be a bit healthier and so i'm trying to lose a bit of weight for the new year and um so i felt like i ballooned but i hadn't um i also wearing horizontal stripes which is apparently bad for that sort of thing but uh, the sort of uh the main interesting thing that's happened recently, um, as you know, as I probably mentioned, uh, I write books for a living these days uh, about the brain and its various properties, of which there are many. And it's sort of it's kind of intriguing in terms of like language and stuff and how it works. Like, for example, here is my first and still most popular book, Idiot Brain, right? See that? Just a regular book. And recently, for the first time in ages, I got a copy of the Chinese version, Idiot Brain. Don't know if that's meant to be me, or <laughs> I don't think they know what it looked like because I fair hope it was going sent. But um, it's also saran wrapped or whatever. I don't actually taken it off yet. You know, polythene, whatever. Um, so like, I am. China was like one of the first people, first countries to buy a book, the rights to translate the book, and I haven't seen it in like nearly five years now. Until now, it's been sent, and I think there was some back and forth regarding when they were going to do it and so on and so on. Uh, but you know, technically, it should be all the same words. You know, like they can't, they don't have, they're not allowed to uh, take my words and put completely different ones in. Um, like someone said, are you sure it doesn't contain subtle messages about the, you know, the Communist Manifesto? Uh, well, the original did, so I'd be worried if this one didn't. And I just sort of, it's sort of intriguing me that you know, side by side, you know, the Chinese one is slightly bigger, but look like that. You see, the Chinese one much thinner, much slenderer. Which, you know, even like slightly more height suggests that Chinese language is a lot more efficient, uh, or at least, you know, a lot more concise, or you, know, you can get more information imparted in smaller text blobs, whatever you call it. And apparently, there is a thing in that uh, you know, short term memory, uh, which people like, I've said this a lot before, but it's still quite a fascinating thing that people don't know about. People think of short term memory as like memories from today, or this last week, or as long term memories. It's like months or years, <coughs> it's nowhere near that <laughs> that broad. Um, short term memory is anything like within the last minute or so, if, if you're lucky, and anything beyond that, that's a long term memory. It's all to do with um, the nature of the memory, how it's stored in the brain. Because short term memory is like patterns of activity, like you know the froth in your coffee or the sparkler in the in the air. It's very temporary, it's very transient. Uh, but when it, you know, neurons actually shift around and new connections are made, there's a physical basis for the memory that is long-term memory 
and short-term memory as a result is a very small capacity so it can only hold the current thing now it only holds four things now what those things are can be very variable that's why you can hold like four words in your head but also four sentences uh, and it, you know, to try to remember them or if you can remember like four numbers but you can also remember a sequence so like the brain processes these things very differently but some studies suggest that um, like people in Japan and China uh, can hold more uh, in their short-term memory than compared to were actually the Welsh people and largely because our languages are so differently structured so we think in language you know, we are we think in an ordinary context so a Welsh person who's a Welsh speaker will have a lot of long words to get through so like the the sheer information storage that the brain has to allocate to words for a Welsh speaker is more than for a Chinese or Japanese speaker who have a more concise um you know more perhaps arguably more efficient den dense language that's the argument anyway I've seen but you know I hadn't really thought about it much beyond like oh it's a nice little curious tidbit until I saw this and I was sort of like you know the same book can take up a lot less space when it's in Chinese contrast that with what we have here uh, Unser Werk das uh, the German translation of the idiot brain um I didn't even try to pronounce the Chinese but I can't read it at all this at least this has like the alphanumeric alphabet that I'm used to uh, alphanumeric <laughs> the, Aramaic, Aramaic. The, the English this alphabet that I recognize that's what that is um but for these side by side you can see the German one much much denser and I've actually been told that uh, it's a common problem it's not the right word but it's just a, it's a thing that keeps happening when you translate a book into German you almost have to allocate an extra third to the word count because German language uh very well precise shall we say as there's a lot of it's kind of long, comparatively long-winded compared to your bog standard English and you know like the German stereotypes for efficiency I guess that you know doesn't quite work there but it's a common thing that's why apparently I'd struggled still have struggled to get my book for teenagers and kids translated into German because it's already quite long and they uh, say no well, that'll just make it longer again you can't have long kids books apparently unless it's harry potter which can run to seven thousand pages should you get on and, and desire it um yeah so just an interesting uh tidbit about language there well actually something quite consistent i noticed that uh put all four of my books so we've got uh idiot brain uh the happy brain uh why your parents are driving up the wall what to do about it very big in poland right now weird and the new book a very soon psychological and uh, stack them up and i don't know if it's my editors um it shouldn't be because they're, they're from different people all the time yeah pretty much indistinguishable i don't know what it is about me which runs to which makes i something about the way i write books seems to make they always end up at this size um obviously it's to with printing and formatting but um you know faber and faber made psychological but originally it was by audible so they had a whole different um, set of parameters and um, what, <coughs> why your parents are pretty well, whatever it's a penguin slash puffin book a penguin random house sorry and therefore they wanted uh, it's a kid's book but it has lots of uh, illustrations so it takes up more space but for some reason they always end up running to precisely this size uh, i don't know why that is uh, it's just something about the way i write books i guess i'm not sure if every author has that i'm sure some have different various sizes but at least i can promise you you'll get your money's worth if you buy one of mine which you definitely should this one especially it's very relevant right now and it's coming out in a couple of weeks so just so you know oh another video diary which i'm doing um for nobody's amusement by my own at the moment I need to practice talking not so rapidly as well and also if I could practice talking in coherent sentences and not use phrases like not so rapidly as well that would be helpful I'm guessing uh, it was interesting when yesterday in that I talked I did an interview in the evening with uh, Dr Andrew Holden an old friend of mine from uh, the skeptic circles talking about the process and the experience of applying to go to Cambridge or Oxford one of the elite universities um, as they're often regarded and you know, I, I my experiences of doing that because I I applied to go to Cambridge and I got an interview which I wasn't expecting 
and I went there and it wasn't um it didn't go great <laughs> the fact that I never went to Cambridge beyond that first interview uh probably is indicative of that <clears throat> it was an odd it is really really weird in that it, it would be easy to fall back on the whole thing of well I'm from staunch working class background and came just riddled with posh people and therefore they didn't want me there I didn't want to go there and but that's you know that's an oversimplification and such a sort of you know, you know almost a knee jerk reaction to sort of like you, know, you can't find me I quit didn't want to go with you anyway all about I, they were prejudiced against me and vice versa but you know you have to watch this video for the full story because it's, you know, it's interesting I'll put a link up to anyone who cares but I think a big part of it was it wasn't like I, don't, I can't really blame anyone at Cambridge they didn't do anything wrong uh, insofar as they were doing what they always do uh, and you know, like I got an interview I didn't have to give me one if they were so scared of the proletariat entering their hallowed halls, halls of academia and no, I, I was so far out of my comfort zone uh, it I I was I was at the time I was like 17 I never lived outside small Welsh Magnin Valley uh, my horizons were very limited I've often said that before you grow up in a valley your horizons are like five miles apart so you know you don't really it doesn't take much to expand them a 10 mile drive down the road will do it <clears throat> so traveling further and further afield is quite intimidating and it was just really strange like uh, I remember sort of going there thinking this place is like 700 years old and all the archways are too short because the they were built at a time when people didn't grow so tall because of nutrition etc and you know just people just died a lot then because it was a long long time ago and you know but it was very you know all the stereotypes I'd heard thinking they were just ridiculous caricatures were just completely real uh, sat in this waiting room with some other kids from clearly more well-to-do schools and they were discussing their latest debate club meet what were they discussing like a uh, was Proust or Schauser a more uh, influential writer or you know, things like that and one of them turned to me in an effort to include me in the conversation which is very nice of him and said what was your school's most uh, recent debate uh, about and I think I just mumbled something because the only thing I could think of was the fact that uh, John said Gary snogged his girlfriend behind the bike shed so he kicked him in the nuts and I mean does that count as a debate it was definitely a difference of opinion as to who or shouldn't who should or should not be snog slash kicked in the nuts and yeah but it wasn't quite the level of academic and intellectual rigor I think they were going for but it does it does sort of make me realize you know once you go too far outside your comfort zone it's really stressful you know if I'd gone to Cambridge I would have been I would probably would have made the best of it I probably would settle in eventually but just the idea of going was just like no I, I don't belong here this isn't how things work and sort of thought about that again because yesterday was uh, Thursday when wife needs to work so I was doing some of the homeschooling and my kids were eight and five and it's really difficult and uh, not that they're the problem oh, my five-year-old is very reluctant uh, but all people said it's really stressful like and you, objectively you should look at it and think well it's just you know your kids give them some work on the computer and they log into a few things and why is that such hard work you know why is that such a big deal it, but it is and I think it's because we sort of learn context and situations quite early on and for kids school is like a sort of really important environment a big context of uh, you know, uh, a situation with they've they, they know the rules that's why when you're a kid when you see a teacher outside of school it can almost blow your mind you know, we see a teacher in the supermarket or like I, used to, I grew up in a pub a restaurant and they sometimes teachers would come and have food in where I lived and that just freaked me out because that's not what they're supposed to do teachers hear parents hear Never the twain shall meet apart from parents evening, which is a whole other thing. But even then, it's sort of like a respectful interaction. It's like, you know, it's almost like a diplomatic exchange between two you know, frosty nations. And that is how we sort of see it. And the whole homeschooling thing has really thrown a spanner into that, uh, the works of that understanding. That because when you're a kid, you know, schoolwork happens here, maybe homework happens at home, teachers do this, parents do this. And then when your parents have to homeschool you, it's just so jarring your brain is not really a, it hasn't developed for that yet it takes it takes a while and same with the parents then you you're normally the one who said like what do you learn in school today and teachers are taught educated and trained in how to teach most of us aren't when it comes to kids anyway it's a very challenging and difficult job and 
you know, so teachers are really doing their best, but it's sort of nice to sort of see the, what work they do do. But it's also like the context that kids know that, well, I go to a classroom, I sit with my friends, I do work there. And that's a good way we interact. We form relationships. We have a certain time frame, and then we go outside and then we have lunch. And so it's, it's ordered, it's structured. And homeschooling just changes all that in a way which is distressing when you when you're so used to something. Kids fall into a pattern really quickly. Like they're very adaptable. They're really flexible, but also they're really sort of quick to learn. And I so like, well, I go to school. That's how school works. They've absorbed that for like a big chunk of their lives now. Like, and um, just, to, just to change that from both the parent and child perspective, really sort of undermines some of the foundations, fundamentals of how we think the world works. Like, you know, you, it's hard to be a parent and say, you must do this work. Here is your assessment. I'm going to give you this assignment. I'm going to watch you do it. Also, what are you going for lunch? Uh, should we go to the park later? And teachers don't do that. And parents generally don't do that. It's it's a real weird meld of two seemingly, or what we thought would be incompatible uh, personas. And you know, the kids are the same thing. The parents are the same thing. So it's very stressful all around. And that's probably why it's such, you know, such an uphill struggle. Why parents tend to be indulging in more drinking, which is fine. It's dry January for me, but I'm not judging anyone else. And yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, you can sort of see how, uh, straight outside your comfort zone, it's good to develop, it's good to grow, but do it too much too once, too, too much at once, and no recourse to go back to where you were. It's it's a, it's a bigger deal than that. Like, they've even done studies, like, when, <clears throat> like, obviously, like, fear of the unknown is a thing, also, so is curiosity, sort of interest in the unknown. And uh, if you do animal studies, they tend to, like, if you put them in the middle of a completely strange, strange place, they'll freak out and get scared. But if you put their sort of home, their habitat, next to an unfamiliar place, they will go out and find it, come back again. So in, in, exploring the unknown is good if you've got a comfort zone to go back to. And right now, a lot of us don't because it's a pandemic and we don't know when that's going to end. And that can be stressful. Some of us, you know, just drink more. Some of us to, turn to projects. Some of us just start talking out loud into a camera. And you know, I have no idea if anyone's even listening. But, you know, we do what we can.